Uh oh. Don't tell me. We're about to go over a huge waterfall. Yep. Sharp rocks at the bottom? Most likely. Bring it on. Hi, my name is Shannon. I love animation. I love tropes. And despite calling myself Tall Sword Lady, I'm barely 5'5". Five five. And because I do want to be better than all of the other fellow Americans, I think that's 165 centimeters. Welcome to Trope Talk, a series where I'll be delving into very specific yet widely used tropes that we know and love. Today's trope is heading toward a waterfall with a limited amount of time to formulate an escape plan. What? I couldn't hear you over the roar of the falls! Ah! This is listed on the TV Tropes website as Inevitable Waterfall, and despite there being numerous examples to turn to, it is difficult to pinpoint the trope's origin. However, it can't be that far-fetched because we do have a historical example to turn to. The group was attempting to travel an uncharted river in simple canoes, and along the way they encountered a comical number of waterfalls. Rapids on the River of Doubt were so extreme that their canoes would smash against the rocks and break, or just be lost entirely to the water. The trip's pace slowed considerably, as the Brazilian porter crew had to stop and literally build new canoes out of trees. Because of how much time this expedition ended up taking, and because they had to constantly stop to build new canoes, the group ended up losing a few members to starvation or illness, and everyone else was left weak. And while I don't think this is the true origin of how we use the trope in current media, I do think it can lend itself as an example when we talk about why this is such a commonly used trope. A huge part of media, especially when we talk about fiction and especially when we talk about fictional animation, requires the viewer to suspend their disbelief. So how does this historical event, the suspension of disbelief, and modern fiction all relate? First, I think it's really important to mention genre. While this trope can be found and is found in every genre, its home is typically action or adventure or action adventure. And a lot of adventure based stories follow a group of individuals, typically a ragtag group of friends, as they go on a major quest or a series of smaller quests and have some wacky hijinks along the way. And I think a huge part of this is going to come down to whether or not we're talking about a big quest or a series of smaller quests. And when we talk about smaller quests in a series, you're thinking a TV series. So shows like Avatar The Last Airbender, She-Ra and the Princesses of Power, Teen Titans, Adventure Time, and plenty of others. Come on kids with me, fall to adventure! And when these shows that follow adventure are broken into a series of smaller adventures, even if they're leading up to something bigger and more important, I think the big question comes down to how are they getting around? What's the mode of transportation? We don't have a crew, we don't have any equipment, or even a real ship for that matter. There is no way we'll ever make it like this. Yep. In Avatar The Last Airbender, the group flies around on Appa, their 10-ton flying bison. This is Appa, my flying bison. Right, and this is Katara, my flying sister. In Shira and the Princesses of Power, they forewent many of the more comical modes of transportation that were used in the 80s, and instead Glimmer teleports them around with her magical powers. Be right back. She gonna do that all the time now? Oh, definitely. In Adventure Time, Jake can stretch, which is really convenient for walking around. Even though I got my soul sucked, I'll still give you a ride to Bonnie's. Because I'm good. And in Teen Titans, everything they have between their fancy cars and spaceships is ambiguously funded by Bruce Wayne. It's either that or taxpayer dollars, and honestly, I'm not sure which is more fitting. And an onboard computer that links with my systems, so I can literally feel the road. The point is, in any sort of adventure or action-based media, the transportation, how the characters get around, is super important. I've only touched on television in a series of quests, and that's because in TV shows about adventure, typically it's more about what happens at each location traveled to than the travel itself. Adventure or action movies are typically the other way around. There's one big quest or one big adventure, and the travel aspect of it is pretty much the whole thing. The whole point of Lord of the Rings is getting the ring to Mordor to destroy it. And I know an early joke on the internet was, why didn't they just take those birds there? And while people have come up with very well thought out answers to that, at the end of the day, the story would not be as exciting or interesting if Samwise and Frodo popped on a bird, flew over the volcano, and tossed the ring in. TV shows and movies, while they can both use the inevitable waterfall trope, tend to use it differently. And I love comparisons, so I'll be comparing Tinkerbell and the Great Fairy Rescue to an episode of Avatar The Last Airbender in Season 1, The Waterbending Scroll. 
In Tinkerbell and the Great Fairy Rescue, one of the major plot lines is about the fairies trying to get to Tinkerbell to rescue her. To me, that sounds like an adventure or quest story. The only thing is, fairies fly. That would be their first mode of transportation and the easiest. So they make it rain. Great. Fairies can't fly in the rain. This is where the heart of the inevitable waterfall trope comes to play. They whip up a makeshift boat, because boats are almost always the quickest and most logical mode of transportation. Unfortunately, I didn't feel like learning all of their names to use this as an example because I'm fake, so this one fairy who's like out serving all of the other fairies is in the middle of talking about how this route will take them directly to Tinkerbell when the waterfall strikes. This road should take us straight to the human house. It's actually really funny too, because when you look at it, it's so small, but they're also small, so to them it's really scary. Anyway, to quaff the Wikipedia page word for word, despite smooth sailing at first, the boat encounters a waterfall and crashes, forcing the party to proceed on foot. Key phrase, forcing the party to proceed on foot. Using a boat as your primary method of transportation is logical. So movies that kind of center the quest as its main plot tend to get rid of that as an option right from the start. And what better way to get rid of a boat? than a massive waterfall, or a tiny one for tinier little fairies. Essentially, the writers are giving us an explanation as to why that kind of a thought didn't enter the character's head. The key takeaway is that this trope forces the group to consider alternative methods from getting from point A to point B. Consequently, that will make the movie one, longer, and two, more interesting. In terms of time, this hiccup allows Tinkerbell more time to develop her personal story, which I think is about befriending a girl whose dad doesn't love her enough or something. I don't know. I didn't watch this movie, I'm sorry. In terms of excitement, this waterfall scene is action-packed itself, but it also forces the group to proceed on foot, which means that their adventure is, again, longer, but could also involve more danger and thus more excitement. Alright, so we touched on movies, let's turn to TV. In this early episode of Avatar The Last Airbender, this trope isn't used to set up some major obstacle for the group. In fact, it's used to set up the resolution, and that's why this trope is introduced in the final minutes of the episode. I don't even think I really need to explain the plot of this episode, it was one of the most rerun episodes on Nickelodeon back in the day, but essentially Katara re-steals a stolen water tribe scroll to try to outdo Aang because he is improving more quickly than she is at waterbending. She's feeling self-conscious. So technically, the actual obstacle is that the pirates are chasing them, trying to kill them, but really the obstacle is that Katara needs to learn to prioritize teamwork over competition. So if the inevitable waterfall trope is actually setting up the resolution, how does that work? We can stop the boat! Aang, together, push and pull the water! So the solution is for Katara and Aang to waterbend together to avoid plummeting to their death. However, this trope tends to push people over the waterfall anyway, even if they do find a good solution, so that obviously happens, but as if to stress the importance of having a sentient mode of transportation, Appa flies in to save the day. The thing is, Avatar The Last Airbender isn't against using transportation as a point of contention. Instead of their boat breaking on a waterfall, though, Appa is stolen by sandbenders. And I don't know about you guys, but in my family, this was known as the worst arc ever. My mom still calls it that time that Aang was being really pissy. And while I will defend Aang for my mom, I do think this arc could have been shortened, if not completely removed, because I feel like the chase episode did enough to show how reliant on Appa the group had become for transportation. I don't know, maybe there was more to it than we ride on Appa a lot. I don't want to think about it right now. My brain's on waterfalls. And while there's more than one way to use this trope, I do find that typically movies are using it to kind of explain why the group wouldn't be having a more easy time traveling to their destination, and then typically in TV shows it's to convey a larger theme, typically about friendship, in a more fun and familiar manner. I can actually think about another example of the latter in Adventure Time. In the season 5 episode, Bimo Lost, Bimo befriends a bubble and accidentally kidnaps a baby ambiguously named Sparkle or Ricky. Bubble, what do you think our baby's name is? How about Sparkle? No, I think he looks like a Ricky. And while 90% of what happens in Adventure Time is just random or for laughs and not that deep until you get to the parts that are that deep, I could argue that this episode is about teamwork. It's Bimo's bravery and Bubble's brains that save the baby from falling over the waterfall. Bubble! You have to save our lives! Uh, maybe I can hold out this leaf. Uh, uh. It's 
It's also pretty funny because while this is actually a really scary situation, a baby is about to fall over a waterfall, Bimo doesn't give a fuck. It's also pretty obvious that the writers were aware that this was tropey when they added it in, but like I always say, adding a trope isn't necessarily a bad thing, it's about knowing how to use it. Now, arguably the most popular example of this trope is from The Emperor's New Groove. Uh oh. Don't tell me. We're about to go over a huge waterfall. Yep. Sharp rocks at the bottom? Most likely. Bring it on. As Cusco and Pacha are heading towards this waterfall, they are just breaking the fourth wall. They're saying, oh god, there's a waterfall, isn't it? Sharp rocks, of course, yes. It's just so theatrical that them being aware of the situation is what makes the scene so comical. And the thing about the Disney death concept is that heroes don't die, and if villains die, it's done in a very ambiguous manner that's left up for interpretation. And because we know that Cusco and Pacha are heroes, they're not going to die when they fall over this waterfall, even if there are sharp, jagged rocks at the bottom. That's just how Disney works. First and foremost, I think the scene was supposed to establish the disconnect between the two characters and show that in order for them to succeed on their journey, they had to work together. But this particular instance of the inevitable waterfall trope is also used to justify a longer movie, like I said before. Again, stated directly on Wikipedia, with the bridge destroyed, Pacha and Cusco face a four-day journey to the palace. Not a carbon copy, but pretty damn close to the default version of this trope. But I don't want to sit here and pretend that this trope can't be customized. I only saw the first 20 minutes of Paddington 2, but it told me everything I need to know about how they were using this trope in their movie. As a cub, Paddington is being carried down a river and nearly falls over a waterfall. Aunt Lucy and Pastuzo save him, and that kind of works into how he feels indebted to them. And then the movie immediately goes into present day, where Paddington is trying to think of a really awesome gift to give Aunt Lucy for her birthday. So that whole scene was just setting up his debt owed to her, essentially. So the whole point of using the trope in that instance had nothing to do with the greater theme of the plot, but more about how he felt about Aunt Lucy. Lower, Pastuzo, lower! Ah! We've got a cup to raise. Also, I guess they're bears, so I can't really criticize them being near a waterfall. Like, that's their business. There are numerous examples of this trope, for all different reasons, but I do think it's very common in movies to use this to not just set the tone, to show that the heroes are enduring numerous obstacles, but to also justify why their journey might be longer because they're not traveling by boat. In television, it tends to either set up the plot for a smaller episode, like a miniature quest, or it's used to convey a larger theme, friendship, or teamwork. There is an infinite number of ways to use this trope. You can explain a debt owed, explain why a group was split up Scooby-Doo style, or even just show off sick animation skills. What I really like about this trope, though, is that no matter how many times it's used, it's never at the expense of someone, and it's something that I don't think any of us have gotten sick of yet. There's always some action, always some brain work, and it's just fun to look at. There's nothing as classic as heading towards a waterfall and almost, but never actually dying from it. A deadly waterfall! 